Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This weekend is the beginning of a whole bunch of different stuff. It's the beginning of a new church year, for one thing, which means it's also the beginning of Advent, because that's when the church year starts. It's the first weekend in December, which means not only the church, but really a lot of people outside the church, too, are counting down to Christmas. And this week, it also marks the beginning of our Advent sermon series. And uh, this, this year in Advent, we're focusing on the idea of joy. And really, what better thing to focus on, right, as we move toward the birth of our Savior and the celebration of the Nativity. Uh, the sermon series this, this year is called The Weary World Rejoices, and uh, as you probably know, that's a line from Old Holy Night, great Christmas song. And I think it really kind of encapsulates for many of us the experience of this season and this time of year. On the one hand, there's often great joy as we move toward Christmas. Uh, there's family gatherings uh, during the holiday. There, there's times that we see people that we haven't seen in a long time, and we get to reconnect and spend time with the people that we love. But on the other hand, this can be a time of great weariness as well. And that weariness can come from all kinds of different things. So throughout the sermon series, we're going to be looking at aspects of the gospel that bring us joy. And we'll also be looking at aspects of ourselves and aspects of our world that lead to weariness. And sometimes that's stuff that happens to us. Sometimes it's stuff that happens because of us. But the real beauty, I think, and the real joy about thinking about that stuff, the, the stuff that makes us weary, the stuff that's difficult, the beauty of thinking about that is that God meets all of it. He meets all of it in the quiet manger in the little town of Bethlehem. So that's where we're headed this December. That's where we're going. That's what we're looking at. And today we're talking about joy as a result of forgiveness. And of course, you know, you can't talk about forgiveness without also talking about sin. It's actually impossible because forgiveness is impossible if there's not wrongdoing. If, if some, nobody does something wrong, you can't possibly forgive them, right? So we can't talk about forgiveness without talking about sin. And our Old Testament reading from the book of Isaiah, it helps us out in, in our reflection this morning. Uh, so Israel, as you may know, the book of Isaiah is written to Israel in a very difficult time in their national history. They're in exile. They're in Babylon. They're away from home. So they've seen all kinds of terrible stuff when leading up to this time uh, of exile. They've seen their homeland destroyed. They've seen the Babylonians come in and overrun their, their property, burn down their houses, burn down the houses of people around them. And they've even seen the temple itself, the dwelling place of God on earth, burned to the ground. Many of them then, most of them in fact, were led off to Babylon, led off into exile. Estimates kind of vary as to how far that is. I mean, we know how far it was as the crow flies, but how far they actually had to go on their route to Babylon. Estimates vary pretty wildly. Anywhere from about 700 miles they had to walk to about 2,000 miles they might have had to walk. We're not sure, but the point is this. However far they had to go, they had to go an awful long ways, and they were an awful long ways away from their home. They were an awful long ways away from their land. They were an awful long ways from everything and every one that they found familiar. In other words, they were very, very isolated when they were in exile. Isolated, it seemed, even from God himself. And a big part of the message of the book of Isaiah is telling Israel that it's all a result of their own sin. See, Isaiah's message to Israel, and his message really to us too when we read the book today, is that sin isolates. Let me read you verse 7 from our reading this morning, or part of verse 7. This is what it says. For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. Did you hear that first part? Hidden your face from us. That's isolation talk. It's isolation. See, sin breaks relationships. It breaks relationships here on earth. It breaks down households. It breaks down families. It breaks down organizations. It breaks down churches. And it even breaks our relationship with God. It isolates people. It isolated Israel from absolutely everything that they held dear. The people were in Babylon for a long time. They were there for decades. And listen to the second part of verse 7. 
You have made us melt in the hands of our iniquities. Melt in the hands of our iniquities. Israel wasn't just isolated. They weren't just aware of their own sin. They were weary of both of those things, weary of the pressure of knowing that they'd done wrong and the results of that wrongdoing that they were experiencing. They were weary because of their sin. And you find this kind of writing all over the place in the Bible. Psalm 137 is a real famous psalm. You probably recognize the first line. I'm going to read it here in a minute. It's been put to music a number of different times. But it's written in Babylon, and here's what it says. The first line is, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. Sin isolates. It isolates. And that isolation Israel, it made Israel weary because of their sin and because of the, the consequences of their sin. So looking back at that, that's Israel, but it really should come as no surprise to us either that sin isolates us. And really, it isolates two different kinds of relationships. One relationship it isolates is between us and other people. And you probably know this pretty well in your own life. I mean, think for a minute about your relationships. Is there somebody that you don't talk to very much anymore, or maybe don't talk to at all anymore? Somebody who maybe said something or did something that rubbed you the wrong way? My guess is probably every single person sitting in here, no matter how young or how old you are, has a person like that in their lives. Somebody, so, you know, sometimes what happens is somebody does something kind of drastic and it breaks the relationship all at once. It's very hurtful for you and the relationship kind of ends at that point or at least gets much more distant at that point. And so you stop talking to them or something like that. And at other times, it's more a matter of kind of a death by a thousand cuts sort of thing where it's slow but deep and growing anger at how somebody treats you that, that drives you away from the relationship, sometimes very gradually. And we do that for a lot of reasons, but sometimes we do it in hopes that the other person will like learn their lesson or something like that, when in fact much of the time they don't even know what lesson that they're supposed to be learning. That kind of anger isolates, that kind of sin isolates. And you could be on the other side of the coin for that sort of relationship too, by the way. You could be in the midst of, you, or looking back on a relationship that you've messed up, that you've broken because of your sin. And I'll tell you, that's a hard place to be. It's kind of like Israel, we melt in the hands of our iniquities. It's a hard place to be because when you've done something, or I've done something, or we've done something to break the relationship, not only do you feel terrible, and not only is there the great weight of your own sin on your shoulders, but you're also helpless. There's really not much you can do other than repentance, other than humbling yourself, other than saying that you're sorry, other than asking for forgiveness, other than seeking to learn and striving to do better in your life. But as far as that repairing that relationship goes, there's almost always nothing you can do or you can say to fix that relationship without making it worse. It is completely in the hands of the other person. Forgiveness is in their hands, not in yours. Sin isolates in our earthly relationships. It drives us apart from the people around us. That's the first kind of relationship. But the second kind is our relationship with God himself. And remember, this has always been the case throughout all of history, that hit, his sin isolates God or people from their God. It was, the same, it was the case all the way back in the Garden of Eden. That's why there's a, an angel with a flaming sword at the entrance to the garden. That's why Adam and Eve get kicked out. That's why God threatens after the golden calf thing to send the people into the land by themselves because he can't exist with sinful people. That's why Israel gets carried into Babylon. That's why they stay there for all those years. Sin isolates us from a God who is holy and a God who is perfect. Because see, those two things just can't exist together. It's like two, uh, the same side of two very powerful magnets. You ever tried to put two magnets together on the same side? It just won't work, right? They push against each other all the time. They repel each other. And that's how it is with sinful people and a holy God. God can't and won't exist with sinful people. And sometimes we get the impression, I think, as New Testament Christians, that it's just not that big, big of a deal anymore because Jesus already came. And let me be very clear on this. That's not the case. Sin always has and always will repel a holy and a perfect God. Always. It will always isolate us 
from a holy and a perfect God. And sometimes it does it very quickly, sometimes it does it very slowly. But when we refuse to repent, when we refuse to hear God's word that calls us out for our sin, when we refuse repentance, sometimes it gets so bad that the relationship is completely broken and it's finally just gone. And it's not because God went anywhere. It's because we do. It's because in our sin, we leave the faith ultimately. That's the real danger of unrepentant sin. God doesn't go anywhere, but we do. Sin isolates. And it, I mean, sometimes it's very practical. You know, think about this. Very simple example. Our own grudges, our own sin, or maybe even our own shame, they drive us away from church. They mean we don't come as much or we don't come at all. They drive us away from the place where God meets his people with forgiveness in word and in sacrament. Sometimes it's very simple, but sin isolates, and ultimately it can drive us away from faith. It can isolate us even from God. But forgiveness changes everything. And that's the message for today. Sin isolates, but forgiveness brings back together. And the thing is, when you're a sinner, in your relationship with God, forgiveness is totally out of your hands. There's nothing you can do to make God forgive you. In Israel's sin, in their isolation from God, they knew exactly what they needed. This is verse 1 from our reading. Listen. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. They knew exactly what they needed. Sin isolates, but forgiveness brings back together. And as sinners, Israel could not go to God. They could pray to God, but they couldn't go to him and make them forgive them. They needed God to come down, God to come to them. And he does that. He does that in all kinds of different ways. He brings them back from the exile after like 60 years in exile. He brings them back. He helps them to rebuild their homes and rebuild their cities and even rebuild the temple. And he comes to be there, to dwell there. Again, he does all kinds of great stuff. But that's all in preparation for what Isaiah 64.1 is really actually talking about. The time when God comes down. The incarnation. The first Christmas. The, guy, the time when God himself comes down to earth in a way that nobody expected. It's looking forward to the day when God took on flesh so that he could also take on our sin and bridge the gap between himself and sinners. See, Israel knew that they needed forgiveness and they knew they needed God to come down. But what they didn't know, what they had no idea about was the length to which God would go to forgive them. They had no idea the depth of the love of God for them. And that's where we find joy in forgiveness. Because that same deep love that he has for Israel, he has for you, and he has for me. When we're weary from our sin, when we're weary from the pressure of knowing that we've done something wrong, when we're weary from our isolation from God and from other people, forgiveness brings together and forgiveness brings joy in that unity. The same forgiveness that they looked forward to, even though they didn't really know what they were looking forward to, the same forgiveness that they looked forward to, we get to look back on. We get to look back and cling to the cross. We get to look back at the time when, when God came down to earth and then was lifted up from the earth on the cross for our sins. We get to look back on the deep, deep love that we were shown on the cross. We get to look back on a God that came down to us. And we rejoice that he abides with us right now in his word and in his sacraments and in absolutely every facet of our lives. That's where joy comes from. And that's a reason to be joyful no matter what you're going through right now. And the thing about joy is that it's meant to be shared. This is a, this is a Christmas story thing. Remember the, the shepherds in the Christmas story? Uh, the sharing of joy is a big deal in the, in the Christmas story. When the angels come to the shepherds, you remember what they say? Fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy. For unto you in the city of David is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And, and so they go, and when they see joy incarnate lying in the manger, what do they do? They go back and they tell everybody. And everybody marvels at the message that they received and what they heard from the angels. Joy is meant to be shared. And forgiveness is like that too. You're forgiven. 
God drew near to you when he didn't have to, when you were dead in your sins, when you were isolated from God, God came near to you. He drew near to you in forgiveness in the waters of your baptism. And forgiveness was brought to you and it's meant to be shared by you because forgiveness brings together. It did, and there's tons of examples of this, but one is uh, the, the case of Mary Johnson. Forgiveness brought together in Mary Johnson's life. Mary Johnson's son, Laramian, was killed when he was very early, or when he was very young. He was a teenager uh, when he died, and it was during an argument at a party. He was shot and killed by a guy named O'Shea Israel. And O'Shea was arrested, he was convicted, he was imprisoned. So he was literally, by his sin, he was literally isolated from the entire world. He was, he was brought away from the entire world. The problem was Mary wanted to talk to him. Mary wanted to talk to O'Shea, talk to the man who had killed her son. And so she reached out to him, asked for a meeting, and he said no. She waited about another year and reached out to him again, and this time he said yes. And I'd like to tell you that Mary went to that meeting to, to forgive O'Shea, but that wasn't the case. She went there to understand. She went to, there to, to ask this guy who'd killed her son why why he took everything away from her. She went there in anger and in resentment. And she sat down. And, and, and as they sat down, 10 minutes turned to 20, 20 turned to an hour, one hour turned into two hours. And they talked and they talked and they talked. And slowly over time, what happened is O'Shea, the convicted murderer, O'Shea, got to know Laramiam, a guy that he hadn't known at all before the night that he, that he killed Laramian. He got to know Laramian. He got to know a lot about him. And he also got to know Mary. And Mary got to know him. And as you can imagine, that was a pretty emotional meeting, a pretty emotional conversation. And toward the end of the two hours, Mary was very, very emotional. And she got up to go, but she was so emotional, in the midst of tears, she stood up and she started to pass out. And O'Shea, who had gotten to know this woman over the last couple of hours, didn't want her to fall down, didn't want her to hurt herself, so he caught her. And the catch turned into a hug. And after she left the room, she started to feel something different. Not anger, but compassion. And not resentment, but forgiveness. After that meeting, more meetings followed. They talked and talked and talked over the next few years, and after O'Shea had served 17 of his 25-year sentence, he got out. Today, and this is a true story, by the way, today, he lives in the same apartment complex as Mary. In fact, they're next-door neighbors. They talk out on their porch. Most days, he takes her trash out for her. And he does all that because he knows that he can't change what he took from her. But what he can do is be there for her now. And as for Mary, I want to read you what she says. This is an inter a radio interview that they did where, where they, they talked to each other. It was a re recorded conversation between the two of them. So this is Mary talking to O'Shea, and she says, I didn't get to see Laramie and graduate, but you're going to college, and I'll be able to see you graduate. I didn't get to see him get married, but hopefully one day I'll be able to experience that with you. And they close the radio interview by saying to each other, I love you. Sin isolates, but forgiveness brings together and it brings joy even in the midst of unimaginable circumstances. So with that story in mind, and with the death and the resurrection of Jesus in mind, I want to leave you with something to think about. You're probably going to have a Christmas gathering with your family this year. Is there isolation in your family as a result of some past sin? Is there forgiveness that you need to seek from somebody else in your family? Or forgiveness you need to give to somebody else in your family? If the answer is yes to any of that stuff, there's 21 shopping days till Christmas. Which means you've also got 21 days to seek forgiveness or to give forgiveness 
21 days to share forgiveness with the people that you love. 21 days to get rid of the weary isolation of sin and to be a part of bringing people together in forgiveness to share the joy of the season, to share the joy of the birth of Jesus. Because after all, forgiveness and joy is what God brings to us in the manger. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time,